So uh, my name is Chad. It's my colleague Ryan. Uh, we're here from Electrona. I know uh, some of you may already be familiar with some of the solutions that uh, that we have today. We're going to be talking uh, specifically about uh, patch management and our Electrona patch product. Um, also going to be talking about a few other things today, but just wanted to give a little introduction and um, say hi to everybody today. Um, just a little bit of information about us. Uh, Electron has been a sponsor here at Mac Admins Conference for a number of years. Um, our goal is to support you, the IT administrator, supporting Apple devices within your organization. Um, I figured rather than trying to, you know, provide some kind of cheesy sales pitch about our organization, we'd just leave it to some quotes from from some of our customers talking about uh, a little bit about what we do and how we've helped their organizations. Um, we provide services and software solutions for IT administrators managing Apple devices, um, really specifically focused on the Mac. Um, so if there's you know something that we can help you with, help you achieve those goals within your organization, um, help you make your manager happy, help make your security team happy, uh, you know that's what we're here to do. Um, and as part of that, we have uh, kind of four different solutions that uh, you can come talk to us about at our booth, um, as well as some of the things we'll be talking about here today. Um, Electrona Patch is our patch management solution that Ryan's going to be talking about here in a few minutes. Uh, we'll go through uh, some of the new features that we have uh, in our Electrona Patch application, um, talk through some strategies about macOS patch management, um, some of the challenges we ca came across when we were building uh, this application, and also some of the features that we've built as part of customer feedback. Um, so we'll be talking through that today. But I also just want to make you aware of some other uh, things that we that maybe have helped to you and your organizations. Um, we work with a, a number of folks uh, providing uh, managed services, consulting, training. Um, I know I see a few familiar faces here in the room that have taken a, a Jamf course with us uh, historically or worked with us on consulting engagements. Um, if there's something that you're struggling with in your organization um, and you know, you're just looking for a partner that can help you sort of take your current Mac management to the next level, uh, you know, please do reach out. I've got some information up here. Uh, we've got a number of kind of one-pagers, case studies, things that you can come and pick up from our booth. Uh, we're doing a raffle uh, tomorrow at lunch, so if you haven't had a chance yet to sign up for that, please come down to our booth and uh, fill out the, the contact information there. We'd be happy to enter you into our raffle for a HomePod um, and be happy to talk to you about some of the services that we, uh, that we offer. Um, also want to make mention to our other software application uh, that we won't be talking about here today, but maybe of interest to some of you. Uh, we have an enterprise migration assistant uh, tool called Electrona Migrator that allows you to migrate uh, user data from an old Mac to a new Mac in your organization um, and be able to do so in a way that uh, preserves uh, MDM management, um, which I know has been sort of a thorn in the side for, for folks using Migration Assistant in their organization, um, as well as customizing what files you want to move over for a user. So if you want to exclude certain types of data getting moved over to the new Mac um, and also you know, providing an easy to use and straightforward way for your user to do that as part of uh, like a self-service application in, in Jamf Pro or, or other you know, popular MDMs on the market. Um, so please do you know, keep us in mind if, if any of those things can be of use. And, and certainly if you have feedback for us, uh, you know, we'd like this to be a bit of a conversation today. So if there's stuff that you know, you're seeing and you're like, hey, this is awesome, or you know, this really doesn't solve my needs, here's what I really do need, you know, please let us know. We uh, are constantly updating the product and, and certainly with, with Electrona Patch, we're uh, constantly adding new titles to the catalog on a very regular basis um, and you know, are always excited to hear from other administrators about you know, how we can you know, build more solutions to help you, you know, uh, make your job easier and, and take your management um, to the next level. So um, appreciate you uh, coming in today and I'm going to pass it over to Ryan to talk a little bit about patch management on Mac OS. Thanks, Chad. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan again. I came all the way from Texas to talk to y'all, so very excited. Anybody else from Texas? No? Oh, Justin? Okay. So we all rode our horses here, so um, we made it here safe. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about kind of our idea of patch management um, and how it kind of differs from some of the solutions that you maybe use or have seen in the past or are interested in. Um, we're going to show you kind of some cool uh, command line, um, you know, terminal commands that we can run and things that we'll uh, see. So it's, you know, slightly technical, uh, but going to definitely give you a lot of information about Patch. Um, so first, let's talk about the challenges that we have or that we see or that everybody sees in patch management. Um, the first of which is creating software packages, right? This is something, you know, that 
probably everybody here has done. Maybe you do it on a weekly basis. Some people do it on a daily basis. Some people have tools that maybe create packages for people um, or for yourselves. Um, so that's one challenge of patch management. Another one is once you have that package, you need to deploy it, right? Um, so the software deployment, um, how do you do that effectively? How do you do that at scale, things like that. Um, the next thing that is kind of, you know, people don't really think about as much uh, is a good user experience. So how do you kind of foster a good user experience, especially with updates? Um, installation is not uh, such a big deal in terms of user experience, but um, updates, it's, it's really huge. And then also um, enforcing updates. So you may be in the situation where, uh, you know, you have a zero day for Chrome that comes out, right? Like that kind of stuff happens. Um, and you need to, you know, maybe have somebody update quicker than they normally would, given the option to defer that update. Um, so we'll be talking about that. And then another challenge is uh, basically figuring out what you need to update. So in some organizations, some environments, you, you kind of, uh, you know, if your users are standard users, then you may be in a situation where you understand the applications that they have because they can't install anything else. But if your users are admins, you can kind of get what's called app sprawl, which basically means they can just install whatever they want. Maybe you have an idea of some of the things that you need to patch, um, but the users have something, something different in mind, and they can install whatever they want, and those items aren't being patched. So we'll talk about that as well. And these are just a few of the challenges that you face when you're trying to um, kind of have a patch management solution in your organization. So what are some of those options? Um, first, let's take a look at the open source options that we have. Um, so the first of which, uh, Auto Package Monkey, probably all heard of that, a tool that you can use to automate the packaging of software, and a server that you can use to manage the deployment of that software. Um, the next thing is Installimator. Again, a cool uh, script that uh, is available in uh, GitHub. Um, Armin Briegel uh, created it, and um, yeah, another tool that kind of is popular for uh, patch management or installing software. And then last but not least, basically rolling your own solution, some scripted method, some uh, could be a kind of a, a variation of scripted methods, installing packages with your MDM, um, notifications, things like that. Uh, hopefully, you're not doing a lot of manual creating of packages and things like that, but you know, uh, it, it does happen. Um, so in these open source solutions, um, I'm gonna talk about what was missing for us, and I have to be kind of careful um, how I talk about some of these open source solutions because some people are very opinionated and they love the open source solutions that they, they use. So I'm gonna try to not offend anybody as I go through some of the things that were missing for us. Um, so the first thing is relying on the kindness of others to maintain. So some of the folks that, you know, so let's, let's say auto package for instance, they curate uh, recipes and, um, you know, folks rely on those Mac admins to update those recipes. Uh, and if for some reason, you know, uh, something changes, you know, a lot of people that rely on those folks that, that maintain those updates or maintain the recipes, like they're kind of in a pickle. They, they have to just wait it out until that Mac admin updates their recipes and then they can continue making their packages. Um, that's kind of a, you know, a situ there are some organizations that are okay with using open source software uh, because, you know, that's just what they've always done. And then there are some organizations that, where that it's not gonna fly to rely on people you know, code that you've not written to do uh, updates. So uh, that's just something that kind of uh, we kept our eye on. Um, if for some reason you do have somebody that is gonna maintain local recipes or your local script that's gonna do your patch management, you have to have somebody in-house to do that, right? So that means you have to have someone skilled uh, in order to, to maintain those recipes or uh, you know, update the script. And um, you know, that's, that's another body or another uh, you know, amount of time that somebody on the team has to, you know, take to update software. And we're trying to get to a point where, like, we're not spending all day or we don't have a, a team of individuals doing this, right? So we're going to show you um, why that's, that was kind of big for us. 
Uh, again, risk of bad recipes or malicious, malicious contributions. Again, you're trusting, uh, you know, typically reputable, reputable folks that are maintaining these auto package recipes, but, you know, bad things happen. You're, you're kind of dealing with a, a supply chain of strangers that, you know, aren't, don't have bad intentions, but do make mistakes as well. Um, if you're hosting packages or, uh, say, a monkey server, for instance, you have to have somebody that knows how to ho you know, host packages, do something in S3 potentially, throw up a server. Um, so again, s more staff to, to do that. Um, the end user experience in some of these uh, um, solutions. So like, for instance, monkey, potentially the user has to log out before they get the updates, and we wanted to really avoid that because uh, we want to we want to update and get things updated as quickly as possible uh, for compliance reasons. And again, uh, as you know, some of these indicate time equals money, right? So you have staff uh, working a lot, a lot of these things. If if patching, you know, obviously, you know, we we do a lot of software deployment. We have to make sure that that patching is done for a lot of clients. And if we spent all of our time doing that, we wouldn't have time to do all of the other things that we, that we do, you know? Um, patching and, and software deployment in terms of our time is, a, is really a small amount of what we do. We have a lot of things we need to do. And you do too, right? So uh, the more time you have to spend on other things that, that uh, are not patching, the better. And then again, uh, we mentioned manual processes that you may do. Uh, if you neglect those manual processes, you're going to leave countless systems unpatched, which is a huge problem. Um, so the next thing uh, we have is uh, there are some MDM provided solutions. Um, and I'm, again, uh, not going to offend anybody. Um, some of these folks are sponsors, and we are Jamf partners as well. Um, and again, it's not, uh, you know, there are different patch management solutions that work for some organizations, and that, that solution may not work for another organization. Um, so again, uh, there are a few things that were missing for us with those MDM um, solutions, one of which was the speed of availability of new patches. Um, again, you're kind of relying on the MDM provider to be able to uh, create the software package, get that, uh, you know, out to your um, machines, do testing and things like that. Sometimes that may uh, take a little bit, little bit of time. Um, the end user experience. Um, this is huge. This is really huge for us. Um, you know, we want to try to bother the end user as the you know the least amount of time possible, right? Like it's their productivity means uh, you know the world to the organization, and uh, you know so we want to provide options to make that end user experience the best we can. Um, the re reliability of installation methods. So in some of these MDM provided solutions, um, they're using install enterprise application, the MDM command. And you know, if you've been in a situation where, like in a self-service scenario where a user wants to install Xcode, for instance, you, they basically cl click the button and then it takes forever to install, and you as an admin don't know when that process completes. The end user oftentimes doesn't know when that process completes. It could take a while. Um, so, and that's really because they're using the same mechanism as, as VPP to do these installations using the inter install enterprise application MDM command. So that's something that we wanted to try to avoid as well. Um, another big thing, the size of the app catalog. Uh, at, at this point, we have 360-something apps in our patch catalog. Um, I'm not sure where some of the MDM vendors are at. Um, again, we, you know, we're not disparaging anybody. It's just uh, you know, at, at various times that we've looked, it, uh, it wasn't as, as compelling in terms of size of the app catalog. And then, again, uh, lack of automation. So one of the big things that, that we do with our product is obviously patching software, but when we do enrollments of devices, we also use our software to do installations as well. And that happens typically in like a depth notify workflow or a swift dialogue workflow where we're expecting things to go off in a set order and we know when that is going to complete. So if you're, again, relying on something like install enterprise application to do that, 
you know, like we're waiting for iMovie and GarageBand to install, like it's gonna install when it installs, um, but we really like the reliability of knowing exactly when that, that policy or that process is gonna start, when it's gonna end, if it failed, what the failure reason is, that kind of thing. So lack of automation with some of those MDM uh, patching solutions or what they used to install software was something that uh, we wanted to try to address. So we really were kind of frustrated. Um, we were done making packages. We wanted to get out of the business of making packages. Uh, we were kind of tired of the end user experience that, that you would see with some of the tools that were available at the time. Um, so we, what we wanted was a tool that could both install, like I said, and update the latest version of a software obtained directly from the vendor. So we didn't want to have to store all of these packages. We, would, we wanted everything to be at the latest version of that, that application. And again, this may, may not be applicable for every application that you patch. Say, for instance, something that, uh, you know, like maybe uh, VMware Fusion, maybe you, you want to stick with 11, you don't want to update to 12, like there are some applications that you maybe don't want to include in patching, um, and you definitely could do that with patch, but everything uh, typically with patch is um, the latest version of the software. Uh, we perform compre comprehensive uh, security validation, so again, we're pulling the software directly from the vendor, so we need to ensure that we're getting it from a reputable source and we're doing uh, comprehensive validations on the uh, either the application itself, if it's in something like a, a zip file, or the package itself to make sure that it's signed by the vendor and we're not installing something that, again, is malicious or has been tampered with by a third party on the way down to the device. Um, ensure a consistent and user-friendly experience. That was, again, big for us, user-friendly experience. Um, and consistent, right? Like, so again, if you're rolling your own solution, uh, maybe you have some scripts, different scripts, different end user experience per app. That's not really a great, you know, there's no consistency there. Like the end user is gonna be like, okay, you know, with, with Chrome, I see this dialogue. With Visual Studio Code, it just closes, you know, throughout the day. Those are things we wanted to avoid. Um, we wanted a consistent experience for every application that we uh, update. Uh, we wanted something that was completely automated. We wanted to kind of set it and forget it. Configure it once, and it's gonna go about its, its uh, day updating things, and uh, um, that's, you know, again, we wanted to spend the least amount of time um, managing all of the updates for the devices. We wanted to pick the updates that we were gonna deploy, and then let it do its thing. And then again, uh, we're, we're kind of a small team. There are a lot of organizations that have a small IT team and a large footprint in terms of devices. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible to deploy that and maintain, especially for a small team. So what we did is we created Electrona Patch. Um, we built it again to fill our need for a flexible, easy to manage solution that could both install and update third party Mac OS apps. Um, we used this internally with our MSP customers, so we had extensive testing before we released it in 2021. And we're gonna kind of talk about how Patch is different from some of these other solutions that we talk about or some of the other solutions that, that may be out there. Um, the first of which is it's written in Swift. Um, there, it's, you know, this is not just a script that you know, you're gonna be deploying to your devices. It's, uh, Command, there are a series of command line tools and applications, and um, so with Swift, you have something that's uh, lightweight, uh, compiled, performant, fast, leverages modern Apple APIs, so that was big for us. Um, and again, we wanted to install software directly from the vendor, so we chose not to host packages. Um, does anybody out here, who has the latest version of Chrome that they've downloaded and, and stored somewhere? Anybody? You? Two? This guy, this, that's, there's gotta be more. <laughs> so, you know who also has the latest version of Chrome that they host? Is Google. So, uh, that was kind of our idea. Like, again, we wanted to make sure that um, we were installing the latest version. Like, there wasn't really a need for us. If, if we did everything we needed to do in terms of security, checking the, the source, validating the, the package, there was no need for us to host uh, these packages. And packages are also not the only thing that we're gonna be getting from these vendors. Zip files, DMGs, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, 
so what we do is we catalog software metadata. We have a process that uh, several times a day goes through uh, every application in our catalog, make sure we have the latest version, uh, download URL, oftentimes that changes, code signature information, uh, checksum, uh, the app file name, where we're installing it, a ton of different data points for each of these applications. Um, and that gives us what we need to install the software, verify if we need to do the update to the software, um, those types of things. So again, we're not storing packages, we're, we're cataloging a bunch of metadata about software. So I'm gonna talk to you about how kind of the data flow of Electrona Patch. So basically what we have here, if you kind of split this uh, in the middle here, this is basically the internet, this is the local computer here. Um, we deploy a, con a configuration profile, which is the patch profile that you see. Um, and in that patch profile, there's a list of software titles, right? So essentially what, what happens is uh, the patch agent that we have is a command line tool, reads the profile that you create and you specify those applications. And in, th in this case, we want to update Slack or we've been configured to update Slack and update Firefox, right? Um, so then what happens is uh, we have a patch command line tool as well, and you can leverage this in scripted workflows and we'll kind of show you how that works. Uh, but basically the patch agent um, reads that job list, I'll call it, and then uh, tells the patch command line tool what to do, right? So the patch command line tool says, hey, okay, I need to update Slack. Let me pull that software metadata from our API and I'll, I'll know what I need to do uh, with, with the software. Either I need to perform an installation or an update or, or whatever the case may be. We get that data back, we make a decision on if we need to install it or not. So in, in the cases where we're trying to perform an update and that software is actually up to date, we don't take any more action. We kind of just say, we check, the, we, we check the version on the fly and if that software is up to date, the process basically ends. But if we move forward, um, we then, you know, we know we need to perform an update or perform an installation. What we do is we go out to that vendor CDN to download the software. So um, I've highlighted this here, and we're gonna kind of go into that section and see um, what that looks like. So basically what we have here is the vendor CDN on the right, and uh, the, remember the client machine is closer to the left side. Uh, Apple has a technology called ATS, which is uh, App Transport Security, and that's uh, uh, basically a set of restrictions on um, uh, Apple, basically applications that you create with Swift or Objective-C, uh, so that if for some reason you connect to a server uh, and attempt to get a response from that server, it has to be, um, it, the server has to, uh, Basically, the connection has to be TLS 1.2 or later. Um, it has to have a trusted SSL certificate, um, and it's you know for sure not a, a SSL certificate that's tampered with, and a bunch of other requirements. Um, so if for some reason those those things aren't fulfilled in the request, then we dump the request and we don't download that software. So if for some reason there's an issue with the server or the certificate, we don't even download the software to the device, right? Um, and there's a cool uh, document in um, Apple Developer uh, Support Docs that kind of talks about ATS or App Transport Security and how it works, kind of giving you a little bit of a um, view of it here. Um, but yeah, ATS is w one of the things that kind of prevents us from downloading software that's untrusted, right? Um, and that's before it even hits the device. So if we go back to uh, our flow here, so at this point, We've, we just assume that the download is, is uh, from a trusted source, and we have that package on the device. But again, as I mentioned, um, packages aren't the only thing that the vendors, you know, vendors release software in a bunch of different ways, uh, sometimes a zip file with an app inside, sometimes a zip file with a package inside, um, sometimes a DMG with an app inside, sometimes a DMG with a package inside, um, tarball, FileZilla is in a tarball, um, but in this case, we're gonna talk about uh, package just because everybody kind of is familiar with this icon, but just keep in mind that Patch not only can install packages, but it can install all of those things and it handles them you know, without, you know, as we as Mac admins, if we're manually creating a package for uh, Firefox, you know, say two years ago before that a package, you'd have to create that package. It's a DMG with an app inside. 
whereas now we can, we can download that DMG, we extract the app out of the DMG, we uh, verify security of the app before we install. So uh, we're doing all those verifications locally on the device. As you can see here with this package, what we're gonna do is um, before installation, we're gonna validate the certificate or the signature of that package. Um, and in this case, it checks out. The software is signed by the vendor that we expect it to be signed by. And then we basically perform the installation. And then we check off Slack, because we updated Slack. And then we move on to the next step in the process. Now this seems like it takes a long time the way I walk through it, but um, as you'll see in some of the demos that we have, it's a very quick process. Um, and this process, again, in this scenario, we're updating Slack and we're updating Firefox. Once we get done with Firefox, by default, we rerun this process in four hours. So likely what we would see is in four hours, Slack is up to date and Firefox is up to date, but our catalog update process happens several times a day. So what you may find is, you know, maybe right now Firefox is up to date, but in four hours it may not be. So you're getting the benefit of, of our catalog being updated several times a day, and that just impacts, you know, the devices that are being managed by Electronic Patch so that they get patches as quickly as possible. Um, so before I talk about how you kind of deploy this, this is not super technical, but we kind of had like an inside joke with our team. Like this talk is kind of half about Electron and Patch and half about cool stuff you can do with Keynote. Um, so we're gonna kind of see some cool animations here, which are again, not real technical, but it's just kind of, I wanted to leave it in because it just turned out so great. Um, so basically what we have is a package that you can install uh, but before we do that, we're gonna create the profile that we talked about that has the list of software that we're gonna define to be updated, right? Um, and we have a website uh, that you can do that with, and in this case, what I have here is I've uh, selected to install or update Zoom, Chrome, and Google Drive, and then I've selected to update, if those apps exist on the device, Signal, Spotify, and Visual Studio Code. So, so real quick, um, I can talk about the install or update portion. So again, if you, there are some MDMs out there that uh, don't allow you to run scripted workflows very easily. Um, and if you do, if you can run a scripted workflow, you can't adjust the script or customize the script via parameters, right? So um, uh, Intune is one example. Intune can run a script, but it can't run a script with different parameters. So I'm, what I'm getting at is, if you were to do like an enrollment process with Intune, um, you, you would have to have several different scripts if you were using scripts to, to do installations, right? And again, you can leverage the command line tool of Patch to do installations, and we'll kind of see how that looks as well. Um, but basically, if you wanted to be in a situation with kind of an MDM that's maybe more restricted or had less uh, uh, features of you know, some other ones, you could just install this profile on the device, and even if Zoom, Chrome, and Google Drive weren't installed, those apps would be installed um, and kept up to date. And so you could kind of do like an imaging where you know you basically deploy the device, uh, patch will detect that Zoom is not installed and it'll install it. Same thing with Signal, Spotify, and Visual Studio Code. We'll update those if they exist. Um, so now we're basically, we allow you to create a mobile config directly from the profile or directly from the site. And in this uh, scenario, we're basically just gonna manually take a look at the profile, but what you would do in your environment is uh, upload this into your MDM and deploy it out to your devices. I wish someone would set a timer uh, right before this because we can walk through basically the entire deployment process in just a few minutes and it probably is gonna take longer for me to describe it and talk about it than it actually does in practice. Um, the longest part of this process is probably identifying which applications you want to patch. And when you look at that, when you look at our patch profile site initially, you probably, you know, before you look at it, you have a list of applications in mind. You go, okay, I'm patching 20 apps right now. I'm gonna go build out my profile, and then you're gonna go, oh, you can actually update all of these things too. Okay, this is gonna take some time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a bunch more things into my list because we offer the flexibility to do that super easily. 
So this profile, we're just gonna take a look at real quick so you can kind of see the two different payloads that, that are in the profile. Um, so in this case, we show you the domain of the profile. Uh, it's com.electrona.patch for this particular payload. And, and uh, it's just gonna be the license of, uh, that we provide to you um, if you do a demo or when you subscribe to Electrona Patch. Um, so that's kind of one simple payload. The next portion of the configuration profile are the two settings that we configured, right? So one, uh, again, uh, we have the domain there at the top, com.electrona.patch-agent for this particular uh, domain. Um, and we talked about the two different sections, right? You have one section of apps that we wanted to install or update if they uh, didn't exist, and the section that we wanna update only. So again, we have Zoom, Chrome, Google Drive that we wanted to install, and then for the update only section, Signal, Spotify, and Visual Studio Code. Pretty simple looking profile. This can get uh, kind of uh, unwieldy looking if you wanted to update a bunch of software, but it's very easy to create these with our patch profile, and once you get them uploaded, say if you have Jam Pro, if you upload this into your MDM, you can also pretty easily update the profile within Jam Pro as well. Um, but we'll have another feature at the end that um, kind of may eliminate your need to use this if you wanna update everything, perhaps. Um, so then again, this is kind of one of the things that it's not real technical, but it just looks so dang cool, so we're gonna just install this package here. Um, again, this is something you would just upload our package into your MDM, or uh, even better, we have a script that you can run uh, to install the latest version of Electrona Patch, so you don't have to worry about uploading. I mean, our whole thing is like, we don't want to deal with packages, right? So we have a scripted method that you can use to um, install Electrona Patch as well, and that's typically what we recommend. Um, so again, we just deployed the configuration profile, we just assume. We installed Electrona Patch, and immediately what we're gonna do, um, if this was real time, it's, it's kind of cooler, but we'll just assume this is kind of real time. What you can do seconds after we install the software, we're gonna take a look at the log. This is what we do in our live demos when we have customers uh, on, a, on a call. We take a look at the log as we're installing the software, and immediately you're gonna to start to see um, the, that job list that we talked about start to come into fruition, right? So the first thing we do is make sure that patch is up to date. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do, and I'll let this run through, and then we'll kind of point at specific pieces of it, um, and you can kind of see we're gonna be doing two updates here. Uh, one, uh, updating Zoom, or installing Zoom because it doesn't exist, and we, we can configure that to install or update. And then the next thing is uh, Spotify looks like it's out of date, that bad person with their out of date Spotify. Um, so we're installing Spotify. And that should just take a second. And that's it. So if you look at the timestamps, that took about, uh, a minute or so. Um, so we've, in, we've installed an app, we've updated an app in around a minute, and it happens immediately after you install Electrona Patch. We're not waiting for days for this stuff to happen, like this is happen, happening instantaneously, and you can see it if you look at the log. Um, let's take a look at some of the pieces of this as well. So again, I point out that Zoom is not installed, we're performing the installation. Um, this section kind of describes the process, right? We download Google, or we download Zoom. Uh, we have the package. We verify the code signature of that package. We run through the installation of the package. Um, you can see the, the last line uh, in the circled area there. We've su successfully installed that version of Zoom. That means we actually install the package and we validate the version matches what we expect it to be. Um, so when you see the successfully installed, that means not only did it install the package, but it's exactly what we expect it to be. Um, the next section, Google Chrome, Google Drive, Signal, those are all installed, but the versions that are installed match the patch catalog, so we essentially take no action. And as you can see, uh, the, we basically check those in three seconds, right? Um, so moving on, the next portion of this is Spotify essentially the same process as Zoom, except Spotify is a DMG with an app inside. What we actually do is we attach the DMG, extract the app, validate the designated requirement of the app, which is if you're familiar with PPPC profiles, what you would use in a PPPC profile. So we're validating that that app is exactly what we expect it to be, 
before installation, if for some reason there's a discrepancy in the code signature, we don't perform an installation. Uh, that would be an error. So uh, again, various security checks ensure that we're not installing anything that we don't expect it to be, uh, we, we're not attempting to install, right? Um, and then as we move on, Visual Studio Code was updated. We, we uh, observed two um, installs. We actually, during this update process, we count the installs. Not only do we kind of show it to you here, but uh, there's a, in the configuration profile, you can specify to do a recon um, if you use Jamf Pro. And only if we, we have done some sort of in install or update during this process would we do the recon. So we're not just gonna do a recon if we haven't taken any action. We're gonna do a recon only if we need to, right? So we count the installs if it's above one and you've, con you've configured patch to do a recon, it will do that. Uh, and then the next thing that you see here is we're gonna basically do it all over again in four hours, right? We're gonna check each of those six software titles, make sure they're up to date, um, and we're gonna continue to do that. Now this four hour uh, mark, that's kind of a, a good um, uh, time period that, that we found, uh, you know, that if you have an employee that works four hours, they or four, works for eight hours, pardon me, they'll get two notices potentially if something's open. Um, you can take that down all the way to 10 minutes, which would be super aggressive, but you could do that. Um, so you have the option, again, super flexible, you can do that if you'd like. Um, so let's take a look at how you can use the patch command line tool to do some cool stuff. Um, installs are not quite as fun because it's, you know, if the application is not running, um, you know, the user doesn't see anything, but here's some kind of cool things that you can do with patch. Um, so if you have a situation where maybe you wanted to set up a policy in Jamf Pro to update Opera only if it exists on a device, typically what you would do is you create a smart computer group for devices that have Opera, right? So then you would create a policy and scope that policy to that smart computer group. Essentially what you could do instead is you could use patch, you could run a command similar to this, and you could scope it to every device in your fleet, and it will only update Opera on the devices that Opera is actually installed. So it takes no action on any of the other devices that don't have Opera. So when you have these, you know, we've seen a bunch of smart groups for, you know, this app installed, this app installed, this app installed, you can really eliminate a lot of those with, with patch if you want to. Um, so that's kind of a cool feature of the update only flag. Um, one of the other things that, you know, some of these patch management solutions uh, may not be able to do are developer tools. So things like command line tools. Um, so if you're in a situation where maybe you have developers on the team that you need to get a set you know, number of tools out, there are quite a few uh, CLI tools that are in the patch catalog that you can actually install um, uh, or update as well. So we'll take a look at a sample of that as well. And this is actually what we're doing is we're gonna be installing GitHub CLI, JQ, and Terraform all with one command. And we'll basically run through, do the installations of all of these. And we've just done GitHub CLI, we've just, just done JQ. You see we get a warning, this is an ARM64 machine. JQ is not built for ARM64, it works with Rosetta, so we throw a warning and we installed Terraform, and this happened in 10 seconds. Um, so again, these are not the only CLI tools that are in the patch catalog, but this just gives you an idea of some of the flexibility that you have if you wanted to set up a self-service policy to install command line tools. Uh, you know, you're probably gonna be creating packages for these if you're doing it manually. Uh, some of these may not be available with MDM uh, patch, man patch management solutions, so just something to think about. So if we, if we, okay, we just ran this command, right? So what if we were to do that exact same command again? You have a policy that's set for on, ongoing self-service. Uh, you know, is that gonna cause a problem when somebody attempts to basically run the same policy or the same script over and over again? So we're gonna see what happens when someone goes to run that command. And basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna check the version locally of all of those command line tools. And again, these are not apps we're talking about. These are c command line tools that you have to basically use a command to determine the version. So we're doing version comparisons on the fly 
even for these command line tools, and we already know that we don't need to take any action on these because they're already up to date. But if for some reason uh, GitHub CLI was out of date, we would perform the update, right? Um, and you don't have to use Homebrew. No Homebrew, Keep the right? stuff up to date. Yeah. <laughs> um, so again, we were talking about kind of the challenges of uh, patch management. Um, one of the things is a, a good user experience. So as an organization, um, you know, each organization has different culture. Um, di you know, some people want to see notifications, some people don't. Um, you really want to own that user experience. And so we really like the flexibility that we've built into Electrona Patch to give you the ability to, to see dialogues, maybe not see dialogues if you want, customize that dialogue, and how easy it is to customize the dialogue. So um, some of the things about uh, our custom branding with Electrona Patch. Um, so users are notified if an app is open and it has an available update. So as we saw initially, right after we installed Patch, um, everything that we updated, uh, Zoom was not on the device, so we just performed a silent install. Um, Spotify was not running, so we just installed Spotify silently. Uh, but what happens when an app is actually open? And we'll see what that looks like. Um, so again, users are notified when uh, an app is uh, open and there's an update available if you choose to display the notifications, which you don't have to. Um, that update dialog can be customized for your organization. Um, you can put your logo in the dialog if you want, rather than a default app icon. We'll show you what that looks like. Um, custom descriptions of the update dialog, button labels, you can change the timeout if you want, a lot of different things that you can change about this uh, update dialog. Um, and again, just like everything with Electrona Patch, and hopefully you know, all the Mac admins appreciate this, you customize it with a profile, not some weird command that you have to run. You know, it's, it's really easy uh, with a profile, or we actually have a uh, JSON schema if you use Jam Pro, and you'll also soon be able to do it from iMazing Profile Editor if you use that as well, so uh, stay tuned on that. And this is what the update dialog looks like. It's kind of a familiar uh, icon that, or a familiar dialog that people are kind of used to. It doesn't uh, look crazy. It's not gonna be uh, super obtrusive. Um, it does show up in the middle of uh, the um, computer screen. And you may be thinking like, why why not use Notification Center? You know, Notification Center, I think, is, is awesome, right? But who here maybe has notifications that are in your Notification Center that you've not taken ac action on? Like, it's really easy to just avoid that, right? Yeah, yeah, my team back there, yeah? And that's a problem, actually. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, it's really Finding easy. Finding the button in the Notification Center. Well, yeah. With all these users, the bigger the screen is, the more unlikely they are to see. Or if you're in Zoom, they don't show up. You know, so Notification Center, again, is great, but it, the idea is we wanna get these apps updated as quickly as possible. And if we, if we give the user a notification that they don't see or that is easy for them to not take any action on, then that's kind of an issue for us. So what we want is we want the user to make a decision. So what we have here is, I'll show you a, piece, a few components of the dialogue. Again, very simple. Uh, the app icon that we're going to be updating. So, uh, you know, the user should know, you know, this is a familiar dialog. It's got the, the app icon for the app that we're gonna actually be patching. Um, we have a description here, which basically indicates that Firefox needs to be updated. You can have the option to update. This is the update button. And then you have an option to postpone. This is our postpone button. Um, and again, you can custom brand this. And if you chose to custom brand this, again, it's pretty easy to do with the profile. You can make it look something like this. Um, so yeah, what we have is basically a, a custom dialogue that we've done specifically for Mac admins. You can change a lot of the different features of the dialogue. You see we changed uh, the logo, we've added a title, uh, we changed the description, we've changed the labels within the buttons, we've added a help uh, button that gives some potentially helpful text there. Uh, Mac OS contains a built-in screen reader if you didn't know that. Um, so, uh, I don't know, it's voiceover. <laughs> so yeah, um, we wanted to, again, make it easy for you to, to basically make the update dialogue fit within your organization, and uh, hopefully we've done that. And let's see like, how you can actually customize this. So hopefully you can make this out. 
Um, this is a sample profile that we've used to create this update dialog, and we'll kind of point to the different pieces and what it adjusts in the actual dialog itself. So here we have a dialog title. Um, you, it's a string that you can configure with that key, and you can put whatever uh, title you want on the, on the window. By default, there's no title, but you can if you want. We have the content image path. This is a path to a local image that may exist on a device. So typically, like, you know, like if you were to use Jamf Connect, for instance, and you wanted logos within Jamf Connect, you'd have to create a package to get your images on the device. Same situation with this. We can display a local image if you want uh, in that dialog rather than the app icon itself. I'm going to skip the one below that, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the update button label. So you can change that update button label, and in this case it shows Mac admins love updates, which I'm sure they do. Um, the defer button label, in this case we have it saying negative, which is real passive aggressive. Um, dialog uh, help tooltip. So the small question mark button, if you hover over it, you can actually uh, create a tooltip that's displayed. Um, in this case it would be, hey you guys, but it doesn't actually display in when I take a screenshot, unfortunately, but uh, there is a tooltip there. And then the last portion is the dialog help text. Basically, just configuring that key will enable the question mark logo and whatever text you want to appear in there is, is, uh, shows up. So I'm going to go back up to this section here, um, and I'm going to show, I'm going to point out a few things here. So what you can kind of see is we have some slash ends to create some line breaks. Um, we have uh, some variables within this description as well. So patch friendly name is when you, when you put that in the configuration profile, that basically changes the text that's in the dialog to the friendly name of the app, in which case it's Firefox here. Um, patch update button label, so if you want to tell somebody which button to press, you can do that. Um, so whatever you configure that dialog, uh, the button label to be, you can actually use that text within the description as well. Same thing um, with the defer button. And you can kind of see, I'm circling that here. I basically created some Swift pseudocode to kind of show you uh, different cases of all of the different variables that you can actually use. Patch friendly name are the ones uh, that we used in this dialog. Patch update button label and patch defer button label to adjust the text here. But um, some of the things that we haven't talked about is deferral limits, which we will. Um, you can include those in the description if you want. The timeout you can include in the description. The, the target version, if you want to say, uh, fire, you know, we're, we need to install Firefox version 100.1. If that, if that matters in your organization, you can do that. Um, so instead of actually you know, adjusting the profile to say Firefox 100.1, that's not really going to work. You want to use the variables, and we've included those. Um, so let's talk about how... You know, when you're in a situation where, uh, you know, we've talked to people that, you know, there are updates that people just continue to postpone over and over again, and, you know, they, they want us to build something that basically makes it to where, uh, you know, they give a, a period of time or a set number of deferrals that somebody can, can defer for before there's a force update. So we're going to talk about enforcing those updates with Electrona Patch. And uh, so yeah, Mac admin can specify how many deferrals are available when updating with Electrona Patch if you choose to do that. Um, a force update occurs when a deferral limit is reached. So deferral limits, you can set those globally for all the software titles in, a, in the patch catalog or a subset of the titles or a combination of both, which is what we'll show you. Um, so kind of what's one thing that's cool, if you're in an educational environment, there are some uh, education uh, entities out there that have shared devices. You know, uh, typically we prefer one-to-one, -one, but if it's in a sh shared situation, those deferral limits are tracked on a per-user basis. So if for some reason uh, I get a MacBook out of a cart, uh, I see a dialog for Firefox, I postpone it, and the next person gets it, that deferral limit's not just going to go off for them. So there are, there's a little bit of leeway if, for some reason, it's a shared device. Um, and again, configured easily with a profile, and we'll show you what that looks like. Um, but deferral limits, um, let's take a look at what that, the update dialog looks like if we configure deferral limits. Again, very similar to the default update dialog. We just have this section here. 
um, that shows you how many deferral limits you have, or how many deferrals you have remaining. So if you choose later a few more times, you're gonna be in this situation where you have no more deferrals. Um, you can specify this timeout here. Um, in this situation, we have a timeout set for 30 seconds. And if you reach the 30 seconds, the app is gonna be closed, updated, and then relaunched. But in this case, we have a cool mouse click that I've done uh, to give the, the, we'll just say that the user has, didn't wanna wait the 30 seconds and just updates the app on their own, which is great. And again, uh, we make it easy. Uh, deferral limit, setting those deferral limits are, uh, just takes a few keys. So if you wanna, again, uh, the domain of uh, the patch notifier, which is the app that we use to di di um, display those update dialogues and set the deferral limits is here. We set a deferral limit key. In this case, we're setting a global deferral limit for every software title in the patch catalog of two, which is actually real short. We probably would want that higher, but this is just an example. And then we have some uh, deferral limit exceptions. So these are the, the items that are not gonna fall within that global deferral limit. So in this case, Zoom, just like the example we saw, you had three deferrals remaining. Um, so you can set specific deferral limits per app or globally or a combination of both. And that final dialog timeout by default is 60 seconds. Um, not as cool in a uh, presentation, so I trimmed that down a little bit and made that 30, but you can adjust that timeout um, to longer if you'd like. Um, 60 seconds we found is a pretty good kind of medium. Again, you know, if, if you gave the user five deferrals, they would have seen the dialog five times. We've given them quite a few opportunities, uh, but again, you don't have to use deferral limits. It's an option that you can use, so I uh, wanted to show you that. Kind of cool for making sure that you get those updates applied and we don't allow an indefinite uh, amount of deferrals because some people will defer forever. Um, so initially, again, challenge we talked about is figuring out what to update on your Macs, right? So again, you probably have a, a set, you know, a specified number of applications that you know uh, that you want to update. But if for some reason, like I said, your, your folks that you manage Macs for are admins, they can pretty much install whatever they want, right? So how do we get a glimpse as to what things are actually installed uh, on their Mac. So we have, uh, this is a new feature that we rolled out um, a week or two ago. Um, you can basically generate a JSON report of all of the installed apps, so everything that's installed that also exists in the patch catalog. Um, you can then also limit that report to include only those updatable or out of date apps. So if you wanted to see only things that are out of date in a JSON uh, uh, format, you can do that. Um, you can limit those, uh, the report to include only things that are already managed by Electronic Patch. So if we, take, if we kind of remember the profile that we configured with the installer update or the update only keys, we had the six items there, you can limit those, uh, the report to only include things that are in, that are managed by Electronic Patch currently. Uh, typically that, that uh, number of apps is real small in terms of things that are out of date because Electro Electronic Patch is automatically updating those. But we'll, we'll take a look at how that works. And this is data that your SecOps team would love to get their hands on. Um, again, right now that's, you know, um, especially with command line tools or applications that don't exist in the application folder, even if you have a, a robust MDM like Jamf Pro, uh, you may have to set up EAs to capture versions or the installation of status of some of these things. Um, but uh, we'll kind of show you what that looks like with, with our report uh, subcommand. And allows you to, again, make better decisions about the apps that you want to patch. So, you know, again, if you have no idea what apps are out there, you, you need to know. Um, th and you can make better decisions about what things you actually want to patch in the future, right? So we'll take a look at that. So this is how the report subcommand works with patch. So again, a simple command pseudo patch report updatable. Let's just take a look at the things that are on this Mac that are updatable at this moment. So quite a few. It's an array of objects, and each object has uh, several properties that we're, we'll look at in uh, greater depth. But here we can see uh, Miss CLI, uh, Microsoft Teams, Parallels, uh, Plex Desktop, Sketch, Terraform, VS Codium. Um, so quite a few apps uh, on my Mac that are actually out of date. Um, so of these properties here, 
Again, the software ID, which is what we used in the patch profile that we built initially, um, that will be helpful uh, because you maybe want to add that to your patch profile potentially. Uh, the friendly name of the app, VS Codium. If you don't know what VS Codium is, it's, a, uh, it's the open source version of Visual Studio Code without Microsoft's telemetry in it, so check it out. Um, you can see uh, that this app is not managed by Electrona Patch, so you'll be able to know, you know which apps are managed by Patch, which, which apps are not. And then lastly, the installed version and the target version. Obviously, the target version is, is what we're targeting, and we can see the discrepancy between the two versions there, um, and that that obviously is updatable and out of date, right? So let's move on. Um, the next command we're gonna look at is very similar, but we're gonna only limit it to uh, applications that are updatable and managed by Electrona Patch. So, and again, this, you would think, what this process is doing is it's looking at the entire patch catalog, uh, checking for installation status of every single thing in the patch catalog, checking the version of every single thing that is installed on the device, and creating a report out of that. So typically you would think that would take a long time to do it, but it doesn't. Um, we, this, is, this was a, not a curated video, it was a, a video I, I did, a screen, did a screen capture for, so that, you can get that information very quickly. Um, so again, in this section, we were limiting the, device, the, the report to updatable apps that are managed, and you can see managed by patch true, and you can even see what key this particular app is managed by, and it's the installer update key. Um, you can even capture this information with a Jamf Pro EA, and here's a, a, an example of that EA here. Basically just the report updatable command. And again, you'll get output similar to this. And again, it, it helps you understand what you might need to patch on a device. And in this case, we can see AWS CLI 2. It's managed by patch false. And then again, Brave browser down below. And so what we want to do is, you know, we get the information from this EA in Jamf Pro, and we can actually then go ahead and update our patch profile to include those in our patch profile, and now you know we've we've figured out some of the things that are out there. We've uh, mitigated them not being updated. Right? We're gonna we're gonna start updating those in the future, uh, pretty easily. Um, so that's our uh, kind of reporting feature. We're we're just kind of building it out. There's gonna be more features added to it, and there's gonna be some cool stuff that we do with that in the future as well. So um, keep an eye out for that. The last thing, and again, as Chad talked about initially. All of these things, you know, as we develop patch, um, are kind of things that our customers come to us, or prospective customers come to us and say, hey, you know, we have this issue, or we've been seeing this in our environment, like it would be really cool if patch did this, right? So we have a new feature that we're gonna be talking about um, that's unreleased, but will be released very soon, and it's basically a way that you can update everything with the Electrona patch with, with uh, very simple configuration profile. So where before, again, some organizations, you may want to specify those apps that you want to update. You may just say, hey, I really only want to look at these 20, 30 apps. That's all I'm worried about. That's fine. But we do have some organizations that say, hey, you know, like on your patch profile builder, I want to check everything. But as you add more titles, because we do constantly, uh, I have to go back in and recheck everything. So what we wanted to do is make a way that you can actually do this very easily and we'll actually kind of give you some, some points about that as well. Um, so update all. So a simple way to update every third-party Mac OS app that exists on the Mac that is also in the patch catalog. It determines, again, just like a reporting subcommand, it determines those out-of-date apps really fast, performs the updates in a meaningful order, and we'll show you what that order looks like and why that's important. Um, perfect for organizations with app sprawl. Like I said, if you have admins that just install whatever they want, um, this will make sure that you're updating things that even you didn't know about. Um, again, configure it with a profile super easily, and you're gonna see that. So uh, what I'm gonna show you is a demo of the update all with the patch command line tool, but again, you can configure this with uh, a configuration profile. Um, to update everything, but this is just a way that you can see it um, via command form. If 
Can I click the button? There we go. So in this case, I'm doing a pseudo patch update all, and I'm doing a dry run flag because the output would just scroll on for a while if we were actually performing updates. But what we're doing here, as you can see, the, the, the second you started to see output, we already knew everything that needed to be updated on the device. Uh, some of these software titles, were, the install media was actually already cached. Terraform, VS Codium, and FileZilla, which is a tarball. Uh, we needed a cache, we just did that. We get some more, and, and this, this next section, uh, we're seeing FileZilla is actually out of date. Then the user can actually go in, perform the update, and this all happened in 34 seconds. So let's kind of look at what this output is showing us here. Um, this section again, this is where we're caching all the install media prior to doing any sort of updates. So we're not gonna be in a situation where we need to download AWS CLI, then perform the update. If, if CLI app, we don't need to do any notification, but we're trying to avoid uh, long periods of time when the user sees a notification and then we're downloading all this stuff and then they see a notification 10 minutes later, like let's just get it all out of the way as quickly as possible. So as you can kind of see, we're downloading in the same order that we're gonna attempt to update in and it's pretty much alphabetical until we get to FileZilla and I'll, I'll explain why that is. Um, in this section, this is where we would typically do installs. Um, what we're basically doing in the dry run is we're doing everything but the install. We're doing the download, we're doing uh, the code signature verification. If it's a DMG with an app inside, we're actually extracting the app, validating the code signature. So, so we're doing all of the things other than installing the package or copying the app into the applications folder or its install, install directory. Um, and then this last thing that I'll talk about is FileZilla, right? So FileZilla was actually running during this update process. And so that's actually why it shows up at the end of the process. So what we're doing is we're gonna install everything that's not running. We're gonna get that out of the way as quickly as possible. So all these things are gonna be updated before the user even sees any dialogue. If we just kind of randomly did this, it'd make for kind of a odd user experience with notifications here and notifications there and things being updated here. So we, we wanted to do this in a specific order so that it, it really made the user experience the best it could possibly be. And we understand like if you're in a situation where maybe you're patching 10 apps and then you switch to the update all, probably pretty quickly users are gonna see dialogues for things that they hadn't before. Um, but what we find is you know, when you install Electron Patch initially, people see dialogues, but then as time goes on, those apps get up to date and, and they see dialogues less frequently, right? The more you update things, the less notification end users have. Um, we also have some cool things that uh, we just really don't have time to show, but if for some reason I postpone this FileZilla update and the process is over, um, and then later, maybe five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, an hour from now, I actually close FileZilla. We're actually, we have a process listening for app closures that are also, that have also been deferred. So we'll actually immediately update FileZilla as soon as it's closed. So the next time this process runs, that user's not gonna see a dialog for FileZilla because we've taken the opportunity to update it at the best time, which is right after it's been closed. Um, so that's something that we, like to show, but um, again, there's, there's a lot of flexibility with Patch. We're kind of showing you some of the things. Um, and again, I wanted to speak to how easy it would be to configure that uh, update all. Again, this is a visual reference of the update only keys that we had in the, the P list previously. And you can see we have update only here and our six, uh, five things that we uh, configured to update. Basically what we, we'd want to change this to is an update all key with a Boolean true value. And so we would update everything in the patch catalog, but we even thought about those extra things. Like if you didn't want to update specific applications, we actually add a key, uh, which is an array of strings that you can use to exclude certain applications from that update all. So say for instance, uh, VMware for Fusion 13, maybe 14 comes out, you don't wanna perform an update potentially to the next version, or Zoom, maybe you wanna set up a policy in Jam Pro to update Zoom 
uh, that has client side restrictions that happens after hours, right? So we don't, we don't wanna bother anybody when they're in Zoom. You can set up a policy to do that potentially. So we've just added that as an example. Um, but that's kind of how easy it would be to, to configure the update all. Again, everything that we wanna do with Patch is designed to make it as easy as possible for you, the Mac admin, to do what you need to do with patching and get to the things that you know you you really need to take a look at. Obviously, patching is super super important, which is why we created this. Uh, but we, want, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to to do that. And um, with that, I'll hand it back off to Chad, uh, and we'll. Uh, I don't really have too much more to talk about, so don't don't worry. We'll uh, we'll get to <laughs> Q and A right now, but. Uh, what I want to also mention, uh, you know, again, appreciate the time today uh, from everyone. Um, also appreciate that we have some some customers here, some folks that have evaluated the product. Um, you know, going to open it up for for some Q and A, and and certainly, uh, you know, anyone here, if you'd like to to get an evaluation copy of Alectrona Patch, regardless of whether your organization is in a position to purchase right now, we're very open to feedback. We'd really love to hear, you know, how we can improve this product, what what things it's helping solve for you, what things maybe we should be working on. Um, and also, you know, per the uh, uh, previous slide, um, you know, we, we try to, you know, let our customers speak for, for some of the benefits. So uh, we've, we've got some of that information on, on some documents. Uh, we've got some one-pagers and stuff up here. But, um, you know, we're, we're really proud of what we've been able to build here. And, uh, you know, my, my thanks to Ryan and the rest of our team who are here in the back of the room for, for helping maintain uh, Electron Patch and, and our other software products. And, uh, you know, really appreciate you all being here. So uh, at that, uh, you know, at this point, love to uh, open it up for any questions that you might have, things that maybe you're struggling with within your organization, or if you happen to be using Electron Patch, happy to talk about um, any questions you might have or, or things that, that kind of come up for you. Yeah. So uh, and let me toss the we, catch yeah. box so that we can get it on the recording. <laughs> here, you, do we want to pass it so we don't get... Uh, hit anybody in the head? Hey, here we go. And right side up, too. Okay, so uh, I've got a few questions. So first off, uh, how do apps get on the list? Uh, so depending on you know what catalog of applications we have, it may not be generally mm -hmm. common stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I'd say you know we certainly anytime we discover apps that we find interesting or we find that our uh, kind of our customers are using or our, our end users are using, we try to keep that up to date with with new applications as we discover them. Um, but you're also welcome to to email our support team and let let them know. Uh, generally speaking, so long as the application is available publicly on the internet, it's not like you have to log in to a portal and get access to the installer. Um, so long as the URL is accessible for that update, uh, we'll generally get that added to the patch catalog relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I know oftentimes we've gotten some requests even in the last week where someone's requested a new application that we don't have in the catalog mm -hmm. and we have it up and available the same day. Um, so yeah, we're I think two weeks ago someone hit us up on our Slack uh, and we got the app up in like 30 minutes. So, you know, it's uh, very easy, it, it, you know, benefits you and it benefits us to have a bigger catalog. So we, you know, as long, like Chad said, if it's publicly available, we're, we're down to put it in the catalog. Okay, so the, the criteria is something publicly downloadable. Correct. That you can get to, okay. So mm -hmm. I think one exception that comes up a lot is Cisco AnyConnect, which requires, you know, that you have a license and download it from the portal. That's one that we're not able to add to the catalog right. at this time. If Cisco changes their approach on this and allows updates to be publicly available, we'll obviously, uh, look at adding that, but m most third-party applications outside of the App Store, you know, fall under that category where the the update URL is publicly available. Okay. Now, what about uh, control of named host or named user licensed software? So, how do you control which systems? You could do that by scoping of the configuration profile. If you wanted to update a specific application on specific devices, you could create you know, maybe one profile for everybody except for the development team, for instance, and then you could create a profile specifically for de the development team. Or you could, uh, again, you could use policies and you could scope via a smart group and a policy and you could, uh, what we typically do is we use a script in all of our Champ Pro instances that leverages patch for anything that we want to do a policy for. Uh, that script is available in our GitHub too. Um, so it's, it basically makes it to where you have one script 
that you can use for a ton of different software, and you just have the software ID as a parameter, whatever other options you want as another parameter. So that also could be something you do with a potentially a scripted workflow and a policy in Jam Pro if you use Jam Pro or another MDM. Okay. Um, how do we get, or, or how do you get alerted for errors if you have errors during patch deployment? Is that something you go look in the console, or can you send messages to the staff? We've got a few. Yeah, so there's a file log that you can tail and maybe parse for errors potentially. Probably not the best way to do it, but there's a file log, uh, var log, electronic, we kind of saw the in the mm -hmm. command. Um, yeah. It also does uh, unified logging as well. So everything, and you can get, you can actually get a lot more kind of information as to what's going on um, with patch in unified logging. In our documentation, get out of here. Uh, there's a there's a, a logging um, portion that shows you some sample commands that you can use to to use the log command in terminal to access those logs. You could send those logs to uh, same of your choice um, or you know something like uh, what is the uh, like domo or uh, something like that that could parse logs and give you parse information about errors. Like yeah, exactly. And, and we don't we try not to display the you know, any error messages to the end user directly. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of the times when an installation fails, it's because like another installer might be running, um, you know, the, the user disconnected from the internet during the download. Um, and what we do in those cases is just try it again the next time when the patch agent runs four hours later. So in, in most cases, we're not gonna see like a recurring error. Um, and, and, and in most cases, when we do see those recurring errors, they tend to be things like, you know, there's a firewall restriction or like a proxy in place that, you know, prevents your users from accessing that or, you know, slow internet connectivity or the vendor may have, you know, had an issue with their website, things like that, that, you know, we don't necessarily need to notify the user that there's any issue because the user isn't gonna be able to fix any of that. Um, but certainly, you know, you can collect those logs and, and aggregate them um, either with file log or with unified logging. Okay. And is there any mechanism to trigger an emergency patch deployment or are you, are you limited by the polling interval? Uh, so you could replace the profile and change that polling interval, um, which then, then, you know, it would reread that the next time that it runs. Um, or you could use a scripted workflow, um, like with a policy in Jamf Pro, or, you know, in any other MDM where you push out, uh, you know, like a payload-free package with a, with a script in it or something like that, and you can initiate um, a run of the patch agent at, at any point in time, uh, you know, manually that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Yeah, Thanks. up here. We, no. Catch the hey, you got it. <laughs> um, does your solution currently support uh, like Microsoft Office update or Adobe CC update? For Adobe CC desktop, the, the desktop app itself, it does. For Word, uh, um, Excel, all those, it does as well. Now, the, the one thing that I would say is Office auto, uh, auto update, that's one example of an app that has a pretty good built-in updater, uh, but you can also use Electronic Patch to update Office apps as well, but you know, just to give you that information, it does have a pretty good updater that if you use Jam Pro, you can configure with the profile as well. Um, it does a pretty good job in our opinion, but you can use Patch to, to update Office, um, you know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Teams, um, all those things. So. Yeah, and so, an auto update, I think, has a lot of the same features that we do, where like if you close an app, it'll automatically update it. So you, I know we have some customers that use ours or use uh, Microsoft Auto Update, but okay. both both are supported. So if I enable the software's native auto update feature, like Microsoft Office or Chrome, will your solution compete with the native op that op op I mean, auto update feature at a certain moment? two processes may run at the same time, try to update the same program at the same time. Yeah, for most apps like Chrome, that's probably unlikely because the application is not being updated like immediately. But what I've seen with Office apps is that you might actually have an update that has been installed, but you have to close the app and relaunch it before you're running that particular version. So I've seen situations where somebody has like auto update running and there's an update that's actually been processed by auto update and the user's like, hey, this is not working with patch, but it's already been patched by auto update. So probably, you know, for Office, you'd want to choose one or the other, choose patch or choose auto update. And even auto update is in the patch catalog as well. So you can update auto update and make sure that's configured. And then, you know, again, you can choose to use patch or auto update. 
And one, one benefit with Patch for, for Chrome in particular is, as I'm sure some of you may know, running Chrome for hours and hours on end. Um, you know, you'll see like the, the dialog, you know, kind of in the corner of Chrome. This will actually display a, a dialog box to the user. So, um, you know, you do have both options, but that can provide, you know, another helpful notification. So in the fresh installation or even in the update, if I have a customized um, update or installation flag or parameters, where should I put that in? If you wanted to do something like the update all that we showed or dry run or... Uh, uh, no, I mean like for example in Zoom, I want to disable Chrome, disable Facebook in the installation uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, you already do that, for example, in the command line, in the script. But in yeah, the case I think of you can do that with a profile, right? Yeah, I think you can do it with a profile or a file that's laid down. But um, generally speaking, once those settings are set for those applications, when you do the first installation, the updates afterwards aren't going to override those. So what we'd recommend is use you know use the documented approach to install the application um, with those kind of IT configurations, and then okay. use patch to update. Okay. Um, we are out of time. I know, Chris, if you had a question, uh, feel we'll see you. Happy to, happy to chat we'll with you. To you. Um, and if anybody would like any information, um, I do have some one pagers up here. Please come to our booth and um, also got a bunch of stickers and business cards and stuff, so feel free to stop by. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you.